this episode of the Wrinkled Engineer podcast. The overlord of pronunciation tells us the plural of Prius. We have three small code topics to discuss today. Out of plane loads on interior partitions, wind load reductions for deflections for roofs and walls, and the sawn lumber repetitive factor. Tim's going to share a retrospective on the candlelight processional at Disneyland. We have a surprise authentic detail to discuss on Sleeping Beauty's castle, and Ali has an announcement. Welcome to the Rankled Engineer podcast. I'm Gates. I'm here again with Ali and Tim. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to hand this one over to Tim as the overlord of pronunciation. <laughs> what is the plural of Prius? Okay, so maybe some of you will remember this. There was a contest put on by a Toyota a few years ago to answer this question. And they, they basically polled people. I think they gave five choices, but the, the one that got the most votes and not by a gigantic margin, but like a reasonable winner was Pri. <laughs> so they decided to go with sort of the, the cacti octopi. <laughs> so it's not Pri-i. Priuses? No, it's not Priuses apparently. How do you because by spell that? I think there's two eyes. I think it ends in two eyes, if I recall. So that leads but, me to, generally, when I see a, a Prius, I call it a Prius, in right? A derogatory Jeremy fashion, Clarkson, mm-hmm. <laughs> so. which is how he always referred to them, uh, so, meaning derogatorily. Yeah. Yes. So Prius has worked <laughs> for me. <laughs> It'd be a a pry eye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, thank you for clearing that one up. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to talk about three mini topics today. I think three. That's there, There's three fingers um, that I find are kind of interrelated because they're in the same boat, but they're not necessarily the same code issues. Um, but they all have to deal with like floors or walls. So multiple studs or multiple joists type construction or large area loads. Uh, and the first comes from... IBC section 1607.14 and it's the interior partition loading. So I think we have, we, we joked that we disagree on this one a little bit. How do you apply that load, Allie? Uh, as a wind load. <laughs> and how do you apply it, Tim? As a live load. And who's correct? Me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've alluded to this before that there are some things that bother me in the live load section in that some live loads are listed as 200 pound live load or it says the live load shall be and in this paragraph the word live doesn't appear at all in it it just says 5 psf load it's so weird and honestly you know it does make a bit of sense in terms of the source of the load because it's uh you know it's not from wind really it's it's really meant to be like incidental loading like people slamming into walls and and things like that um which has more of a 1.6 kind of sound to it to me and uh the other thing about live load is as a category you're always supposed to do skip live load cases of every type of live load that you've got whenever it makes a difference. And uh, I I think that also makes sense with this because that would mean that this live load is applied to walls uh, by itself or in conjunction with loading on the floors or uh, only loading on the floors in the absence of the loading on the walls. And and all, all three cases should apply. And I do agree that it's in the live load section, so it's totally a live load. It's not the way I was taught. I was taught that it was an interior wind pressure. Everybody calls it that. I mean, just they call it interior live load. Or sorry, interior wind load all the time. I hear it all the time. And you have things like like this cabinet that's up here um, or back there that that's inducing a moment onto my studs. And so Mm -hmm. having an aerial load is a good way to induce a moment. But really, Tim, the correct way to do it is a notional load, correct? Because it's I think so. It's not really categorized as anything specific. It's a theoretical load that we do just for stability and to make sure that you don't have paper thin 
interior walls with no support. And the steel code handles it in the direct analysis method just fine with notional loads. I don't see why we couldn't transition notional loads into interior partitions. Uh, right. And so I will still do it as a wind load and I've converted it now to eight PSF to account for the 1.6 factor difference between <laughs> the 05 and the 10 code. Uh, mm -hmm. And But I still have to be careful because if I'm in wood design, I get another 60% increase in strength for my CD value on my studs if I'm doing ASD right. and that's not good. So I try and make sure that at least it equates out to what a live load would be. I recognize that in the code, it's a live load. I think Allie's now been converted. Yeah, I always, I was taught it was a wind load. So I was wondering, I was like, why is there wind inside a building? <laughs> You know, the air conditioners push so much air in that they're pushing. No, um, that's one excuse I've heard. You'll hear people say that. You do. <laughs> <laughs> or you slam a door in a really airtight room, right? And that it's acting like a piston. So it's compressing the air or making a vacuum. But I like Tim's point that, hey, live load has different loading characteristics than a wind load. And right. So that makes all. So I'm converted now, too. I will do it as a live load from this day forward. Um, it just feels weird because you don't walk on walls. So, all right. Topic number one down. Um, second one from table 1604 in the IBC, 1604.3 uh, is the deflection criteria for a bunch of different types of elements. And there's a footnote F in there. And footnote F allows you to reduce the wind, lo wind pressure um, for just deflection on only exterior walls and roofs. And it's a substantial decrease. It's a 70% uh, of the wind load. So it's a 30% decrease. Uh, that's back in the 06 code and the 05 ASCE 7. That factor has now been changed to 0.42 to account for 0.7 times 0.6. Um, so do you use this reduction or not when you're doing your alley? You don't... I don't use it really. I mean, I just learned about it earlier this year on like the AISC um, conference. They had a serviceability one, and that's the first time I really noticed it. But I honestly don't take the reduction for deflection. And Tim, I haven't heard of it, honestly. So I <laughs> and that's it's something that happens in in <laughs> California in particular, where where we tend to pay less attention to wind. To wind yeah. So I use this a lot, but I'm very conservative where I use it. Um, I make sure that it's like a wall or a roof, and it's generally almost always in wood design where you're trying to get a two by six to span tall enough, and you're yeah. and maybe even cold twenty-four form. feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you've got you know in Florida substantial wind loads, um, and you're probably not as concerned about deflection. It still meets the strength requirements, and in a hurricane, I'm that's really all I care. <laughs> I'm less into the serviceability requirements, uh, but for columns or frames or things like that, obviously those those elements we're not talking about. But repetitive elements, absolutely, I feel like this is a valid method. Inconsistent, again, we see the code with not handling the virgin loads and the load combinations consistently. They allow a 0.42 reduction of the ultimate wind pressure. But if you were to throw that into an ASD load combination like you would normally do for your deflection design, you're going to get another 0.6 on top of it. That's not what the code wants you to do. <laughs> this is a 0.6 reduction in the load combinations and then a 0.7 of the base wind pressure. Uh, but again, it's annoying, right? We're seeing it again in the code where you could get down now to 0.25 um, <laughs> of the ultimate wind pressure and use that for Why deflection. are we even here? <laughs> yeah, so so don't do that. Please stop double dipping on your 0.6. You just got to be careful with that. Now related to this, um, I would say, is the wood repetitive factor or CR um, from the NDS. So this allows you to increase the bending strength of repetitive members by 15%. Now, Tim, you said you didn't use this, right? Or you're not as 
familiar with okay this one. here's my problem with this <laughs> <laughs> basically what they're doing is giving engineers a cop out for under analyzing things they're they're saying all right, we're going to assume that you're not really looking at the system the way it's actually installed. We're going to assume that these studs, that you're analyzing the studs as though they're just free flying and you're neglecting the effect of the sheathing. What else can you think of in the code where that logic applies, where they just ignore the assembly and assume that the engineer is not doing his complete job and they just give you a reduction for like for nothing? They're like, okay. Here, here you are, you're welcome for not doing your job. It just, it, it doesn't, and, and it presumes from a code level that they understand my assembly as well as I do. And there may be things about my, my assembly that don't make any sense about that reduction and yet people can just take it out of hand. So I don't know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a fan. <laughs> but Ali, you use this one, right? Yeah, I use it, and it's mostly for roof joists on wood, like single story wood buildings that are mm -hmm. competitive that I use it for, which always get sheathed in plywood. I mean, I don't go into further analysis on it, so I guess I'll take that at face value. Sorry, from my standpoint, the span squared over three, you know, satisfies me from that perspective. I don't really see a need. Yeah, for reduction for, of wind pressure. Yeah, on on the the supply side and on the demand side, it's like, geez, you know, how many how many discounts are we going to get here? Yeah. So I use it probably eighty percent of the time when it's applicable, and you know, unlike the deflection criteria where there's only two conditions that it applies: exterior walls and roofs. This applies to any repetitive wood member that's within a certain size. Um, I think it's four inch wide, so four bys and smaller are are allow to increase their bending capacity. Um, the, the issue I have with it is that there's a lot of factors that go into deciding is there load sharing occurring between the studs. For wind loads, I love it because again, I think wind loads are, are high um, and when you're trying to get a wood structure to work in a high wind region, it makes some sense to, to account for load sharing between elements. If those elements are really close together like a built up column I totally get that too, because now wood being a natural material has a lot of variation. If I put three plies together, we have a better statistical analysis of what is going to occur in that group of studs. The odds of having a critical defect are now reduced uh, from a single stud. So I, I don't mind the 15% increase in, in those uh, situations. But when we're at 24 inches on center and we have sheathing, and we're saying that sheathing is going to share the load between all three of those members. How thick uh, is the sheathing? Right. So now this is a flexibility <laughs> problem between the flexibility of the joist and the flexibility of the sheathing. Yep. So if I have a really long span joist and I have three quarter inch plywood over the top, but yeah, the plywood probably can get to the next joist because that center beam is going to sag so much. But if I have a relatively short span and a heavy floor, or even thinner plywood, is it really going to get there? Is the, it, the plywood's going to be more flexible than the joist? It's really what it comes down to. And so to me, that's why you can't just say, I'm going to use it all the time. Um, and Allie talked about using this on roof, roof joists. Um, and I think trusses, I've seen truss manufacturers use this as well. Mm -hmm. In a place like Florida, where I have uplift and my nails are now in withdrawal, is that as good of a load sharing as it is when the pressure is positive and pushing the plywood into the member? I don't know. I don't know that it shares the load the same way. Uh, so use it as you feel appropriate, but I, I say about 80% of the time you, you're fine. I don't think drywall <laughs> is an effective means of transmitting uh, loads to studs uh, and in the NDS, it tells you that plywood's acceptable as, as a sheathing material um, and other forms of decking. And I have heard other comments that the studies don't necessarily back up that the load is shared. Um, That's the thing. And and you said this is this is an IBC line? Well, this is an NDS. So it's in the wood code, but it's been in there in forever. The wood code. It's been in there for a long time. And, you know, 
we're, we're hypothesizing a bit here. It would be nice to see the referenced studies that prove one way or the other, because I think in any one of us, once once you lay out the study and, and, the, uh, and the results, we're going to accept the results, whatever they are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's one of those things I feel that it's in the code and people either know about it and use it or they don't know about it. Uh, but I, it's our education about it isn't as solid as some of the other things. And I think all three of these topics are that we talked about today, not that they're unclear, but there's potential for, for mistakes or to apply it in the wrong situation. If you don't read the footnotes and you don't only apply it to the situations that it says you can. Uh, and as always, you have to watch that 0.6 factor on wind loads. <laughs> We're never going to get away from it. I'm convinced. No. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's almost Christmas time. We've got what, four days to Christmas. So wow. yes, yeah, so since the three of us all like the Disney parks, uh, and I think we all miss candlelight, the candlelight processional at Disneyland and even at, at Disney world, though it's not quite as good. Um, <laughs> it's not as grandiose of a production that is for sure uh, I have a lot of opinions about that <laughs> and you can feel free to share those so the advantage of having Tim on this show is that Tim has sung in the choir how many years uh, let's see I, I, well I've done over 20 shows um, and uh, the first time I performed in it was in 1989. <laughs> so, so to help. Allie's eyebrows shoot up. She's like, wait a second. Yeah. I wasn't alive then. <laughs> There's a lot of events that Allie was not alive for that you and I were alive for, Tim. Uh, so in the absence of candlelight this year, I thought it'd be good to get your retrospective on singing in the choir and, and what makes this event such a, such a wonderful thing to have and a, just a tradition that will hopefully go on after this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not, you know, no, no one's really worried about that, assuming that the parks reopen at some point. <laughs> but um, it's it's something that we've been doing since essentially since the park opened in the 50s. And uh, it's um, it's the largest show that is done in in any Disney park um, with um, you're looking at about 800 performers in one show, which is something that it has over the Walt Disney World version, which has um, a lot more smaller shows instead. So at Disney World, it's it's done, well, originally it was done in front of the castle for, for uh, until Epcot opened. And uh, I think a couple of years after Epcot opened, they switched it over to the uh, uh, American Adventure Gardens Theater. And... Uh, They've been running it there ever since. And of course that, that theater limits the size of their show. At, at Disneyland, they set up bleachers all over the train station and basically use Town Square as the theater because the entire center of Town Square is filled with audience. Um, the orchestra is you know, in, in the front center and then the, the choir surrounds it up on the train station. There's some really good pictures of it available obviously and videos are posted every year but uh we have the the cast choir that does the living christmas tree in the middle of the show and it's surrounded by invited choirs who audition to be in the show and i think what did they say it's about i don't remember the ratio but it's quite small it's like one in ten or smaller that gets accepted to the to the show so the 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 the, the guest choirs who get invited from uh, from high schools from universities from churches um around southern california um they're they're very good they're very good and uh the orchestra is professional and, and we have a uh we we have a, a conductor who's a professional caliber conductor and a celebrity guest narrator and the show is done for the community. We don't sell tickets to this show. Um, it's in the park. So obviously if you're in the park, you, you paid to get in, but the show itself is not, is not exclusive from a, a ticketing standpoint. Um, 
the the seats are are only given away to um, people who are invited by Disneyland to come see the show. Um, so so it's it's always interesting for me standing up there singing the show, kind of scanning the crowd the, there in front of me to see you know who's who's sitting there because I'll recognize various executives, various people from from you know the community and stuff like that 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 uh, have been invited to see the show. But it's about a 45 minute show and uh, it's uh, it's really complex chorally. I can tell you it is not an easy show to sing and I've been in a lot of choirs. Um, so uh, it's it's interesting. It's it's uh, I really enjoy doing it. Absolutely. So one of the one of the big differences I noticed between California and Florida is that I can go to Epcot and I can wait like an hour. And I can get a seat for candlelight. Yeah. It's not really the case at Disneyland. <laughs> no, it's about four hours for Disneyland, I think is about right. And I had the one time that I've seen Disneyland candlelight was during rehearsal. That was the only way I got a seat. <laughs> yeah. We do four shows at Disneyland. We do two on Saturday and two on Sunday, the first weekend of December. And so um, what, as opposed what, to a lot more closer yeah. to 20 in Florida. Yeah, yeah, they do it every night for like the mm -hmm. whole month. And, yeah. And it's really fun to watch Candlelight at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it's yeah. It's a very unique experience. Uh, and, and you alluded that there are, um, you know, guest hosts or celebrities who come in and do the reading portion. Right, the narrators. And the cool thing about doing the rehearsal is they're not there for it. Correct. We, we have a stand in. <laughs> and, and to me, the stand in doesn't get any better. Then uh, it's not Mickey Mouse, but the stand-in does not get any better than the celebrities. <laughs> that would be close. Uh, yeah, Bill Rogers, the the voice of Disneyland, the guy you hear booming over the speakers, announcing that fireworks are going to start in five minutes, or you know any of the other things that they announce. Um, <clears throat> he he's standing there at the podium live doing doing the reading of of the show, which is also weird for us because he's always recorded in most of our <laughs> lives, right? Well, and so, that's. It's the voice you hear throughout the day at the park, and you've heard it for decades. So who yes. better to narrate the, the candlelight than the man you hear all the time? Now, let me tell you a little about him. He is, I mean, we all know Disney fans. He is a huge Disney fan. He absolutely adores his job and uh, the the park and the people who work there and stuff like that. And he whenever he's done with the show every year he gives us kind of an uh, a new speech i don't know how he manages to keep coming up with them but basically his his expression of what what that show means to him and what what us as cast mean to him and it's it's just it's the nicest thing is just you you look forward to hearing that every year because it just makes you feel so good you know but he's he's just He's the nicest guy, and when he's doing the the reading, yeah, he's better than any of our guest narrators because I mean, you know, what he does. He's the, he's the man as yeah, far as that's concerned. Professional, and he's got more practice than any of them because <laughs> he's done it so many years, right? So, yeah, he's he's fantastic, and that's that's a special treat for for us because, like I said, we're the town square is empty, and we're the only ones who get to see him do that it's not recorded or anything like that so mm -hmm. it's just something where you can have to take our word for it yeah it's very cool and then side note his wife is the voice of california adventure which is yeah that's just so cool they're married yeah. <laughs> yes it's it's very convenient um, and of course we kind of left ali out on this discussion because she has not had the <clears> opportunity <throat> to see candlelight so she's gonna have to get she wants it. to now yeah. hey you want to i was gonna yeah, i mean say how many cast members are in the show we have in the cast choir there's between 300 and 350 and we break the choir into roughly four pieces for the four shows so um you know 130 per show something like that and you guys right? all have to audition am I, am I doing that the wrong way 75 yes <laughs> what's that you all have to audition for it every year yeah, well, you have to audition the first three years, and after after you've been admitted for three years, then you don't have to audition anymore. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I would make it, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, it's, it's fun too because you see, you see cast members you didn't know that they were singers, and there they are in the choir. Yeah, so. it's crazy because I mean, you know, who do you have up on stage with you? A bunch of people who, you know, uh, sell tickets in the ticket booths, or 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 popcorn, or run Space Mountain, or you know, it's just any any type of cast member who works there. Any of them, you know, guest relations, they're all there. It's it's really it's pretty funny because then you'll see them throughout the park, and it's like. We're kind of like a secret fraternity because we know who each other is, you know. Yep. Like, even oh, know that engineers and architects seem to make even, it. So even them, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We have a, we have a an, an architect from a former from from the department that we were all in who went to WDI who is also still in the show. So it's pretty cool. It, it is a cool tradition, and I yeah, it's it's awesome. Uh, so before we started, I sent each of you. I texted you a picture. Uh, from from inside of Disneyland, and this is something that Tim pointed out to me, and I think uh, we were walking, oh, no. we were walking out of Frontierland, and we took a left to uh, <laughs> to take the, the West Bypass around the castle. Now, Allie, do you know what that picture is of? And it's on the screen now, so everybody can see it. Do you have any clue yeah. what that is? No, the castle. It's part of the castle, so you must not have been with us. I think uh, there was another structural engineer architect who was oh, walking. And Tim, Tim pointed this out and said, you'll never look at the castle the same way yeah, again. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I think I was there for this one. Too. <laughs> so, I, so I tried to give the tour to as many people as I could, and I usually <laughs> talk about this. Now, now the, the point of me talking about this is I'm pointing out a lot of the features on the castle that are genuine medieval defensive features. I always point out the murder holes. When you yeah. Hate that you showed me those. I'm like, look at you could die from these. Exactly. <laughs> we might have to so get a picture of those. This too. one, this one in particular, is uh, a bathroom, and this is this is where you would take the the chamber pot and basically cast it out the window into the moat. So uh, it's funny because at Disneyland it's right above a walkway. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> walk fast through that area yes, just it, in it, case somebody's <laughs> feeling like being authentic <laughs> it had a very monty python feel to it as far as yeah <laughs> yeah I could see what that. was going on with this and yes the the fact that there's a walkway underneath the restroom that does not have plumbing uh, brought a smile to my face and now i'll never forget <laughs> I, now i can't look at the west side of the castle without being like oh there's there right. it is <laughs> well i think that's all I've got for today. Um, any other thoughts? Anything else going on for Christmas? No, it's completely dark now, so I'm ready to see my uh, convergence of Jupiter and Saturn, which is tonight. Yes, so I saw that three hours ago or two and a half hours ago on the East Coast. Um, it wasn't much, just two really close together dots. <laughs> <laughs> two little dots. Great. Looking forward to it. <laughs> So that is today, yes, the convergence for the next 24 mm -hmm. hours. Well, thank you for joining me. I hope that uh, you guys have a Merry Christmas and thank you. you get too. some get some time to relax and I don't know, do whatever. I'm going to be video editing, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you thought we were done, but we we forgot some one order of business, one item of a business here. Uh, Allie has two announcements, but she's only going to give us one of them. I passed the PE exam. Woo! Yay! And a shout out to Denise. She also worked with us and she passed her PE exam in California. So which state did you take it in? Did you take it in Illinois? Yeah, I took it in Illinois. And you took the civil PE? Yep. Cool. So that's weird. In Illinois, you're supposed to take the SE. <laughs> you don't you don't have to take the PE in Illinois. Yeah, but I work in Missouri though, so oh. okay. and I can't apply for another year anyway in Missouri. All right, well, start start studying for the SE. Uh. <laughs> Highly recommend it. Well, congratulations. Nice. So now we're saying goodbye. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. Good one. Bye.